because the hydrogen innovation space is so complex and nuanced, we are really grateful to have uh, an expert panel with us this morning to talk a bit about some of the findings of CHIP and some of the opportunities that um, are in front of us with regards to innovation in the hydrogen space. So I will call you in one at a time if that's okay, just and give you a couple of minutes to introduce yourself. So John, we'll start with you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm John Hartley. I'm the CEO of Lividian. Uh, Lividian are a, a UK-based company who take waste gas, run it through what we call our loop system, and make hydrogen, and then we capture carbon in a form called graphene. So that's our part of the value chain. Uh, we're a, a two-year-old company, and we have about 50 to 60 members of staff. So we'll be talking a bit today about collaboration, a little bit about innovation, and um, and that's us. Great, thank you. It's wonderful to have SME representation on the panel. Um, now, the other end of the scale, Craig, uh, would you like to come in? Sure, yeah, hi everyone, Craig Hodge. Um, I am the Hydrogen Technology Manager at SSC Thermal. Um, so SSE, many of you will, heard of, will have heard of us. Um, I work for SSE Thermal. We are largely focused on low carbon, flexible power generation. And I've got a role across all of our hydrogen projects. Um, and yeah, hopefully I'll touch on some of those in the, in the panel session. Great, thank you, Craig. Uh, and now for Beth, do you wanna come in? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Beth Foster. I'm Energy Systems Innovation Lead at the Strategic Innovation Fund. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the SIP, um, we're a collaboration between Ofgem, the regulatory body, and Innovate UK. And we have a £450 million fund um, to bring projects into the energy sector to help align to our net zero goals and also to place the UK as the effectively the Silicon Valley of um, the UK energy systems. So hydrogen does play a part in our wider portfolio, and it's actually really critical to unlocking some wider um, strategies to reach net zero. So I'm quite happy to talk about those with you. Amazing. And thanks for having me, by the way. Thanks, Beth. Um, and Joe, last but not least. Thank you very much, Serene. So my name is Joe Huddleston and with my job share partner, Helen McComb, who some of you on the call may have met, um, we're basically the same person. She's just got a very strong Scottish accent. Um, so we look after the uh, hydrogen theme in the net zero innovation portfolio. So one of the competitions that Paul talked about earlier, that hydrogen supply two, that's one of ours. We also have a competition called the Industrial Hydrogen Accelerator, which looks at end to end, um, so from hydrogen production to hydrogen end use. And that experience of going through running that competition has been really helped us as we think as we thought through what we what we wanted to see out of chip and how we've been working through it and i think i'm, I'm really excited about the collaborative innovation work that's going to come from this program thank you for having me thank you thank you so much for being here joe and all of you um and to the audience, thank you for the questions that you've asked so far. Please do feel free to keep asking questions and we'll weave them into the panel discussion where we can. But we have some pre-prepared questions. Um, so the first one, which I'll direct to Beth and Joe, um, is on, I mean, Joe, you've already started to answer it, but I think what are your reflections on the priority areas identified by the innovation needs assessment? Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I think it's it's a really interesting list. I mean, it's a real theme of the challenge of, of moving hydrogen around, which is, of course, this this kind of supply not meeting demand problem that we talk about so much when we talk about the challenge of, de of developing the hydrogen economy. I mean, I think anecdotally, the, the, the projects that have come out as the high priorities it fits so much with the themes of what we've been hearing from our project you know tube trailers supply hydrogen supply is a big issue for some of our industrial fuel switching competitions under our last program and, and compresses um, there's a significant budget item in some of our industrial hydrogen accelerator projects and you know it, it, there, are, there are challenges that need to be worked through I'm, I'm really excited about about working through some of the problems in that space with chip and I think, yeah, I think it's going to be a really interesting platform. I think it will be quite dynamic. It will be able to move faster than we can sometimes in government. And I think that's going to be really important. Um, I suppose one other thing I'll say is that I think looking at the list of projects Rob shared at the end, I think 
I'm, I'm really hoping to see a mixture of desk based research and some physical demonstrations from this. I just think the physical demonstrations of, of kit is going to be so important to kind of demonstrate the potential here. And so I, I think I think we will see that mix, but that's yeah. So I'll, I'll stop there and hand over. No, that's great, Joe. Yeah, I was just going to say, Beth, with what Joe mentioned with regards to chips dynamicism and also some of the specific areas that we've identified that I know intersect with SIF, what are your reflections? Yeah, 100%. Um, so we actually have our own effective innovation needs assessment, um, which we call the challenge setting process. Mm -hmm. And Ofgem has four strategic challenges every single year, which we pitch to the energy networks and we want them to bring innovation, which meets those challenges. And actually looking down the high priority list that, that you presented, Rob, pretty much ours is a, a, exactly the same. Um, maybe one or two little tweaks I'd make. So I think what's really nice is that we're two separate organizations working in the same place, but you know, identifying the same strategic areas to work on. Um, so yes, compressors has been talked about a lot. We've funded quite a few programs in the Strategic Innovation Fund, which look at how we can modify current compression systems in the UK on the NTS. Um, you know, I think National Grid has a fleet of about 70 different compressor engines, which have been installed and modified over the years. So what do we need to, to do when those blends get higher than 20%? What is that going to look like? So we're, we're funding innovation in that sector. Now, in terms of existing pipeline infrastructure, this is, this is really crucial. You know, that there's so much infrastructure that needs to be built between now and 2035. And the only way we can do that is actually maximizing what we already have. And there's a lot of scope in the UK and the way we model our networks to actually create some headroom to maximize what we have. Um, so, for example, we had this really interesting project which used um, specially designed hardware, which was retrofitted into the distribution network which was then attached to some AI software, which can remotely um, monitor the pressures and reduce the pressures in the distribution network. And what that did was created headroom to add um, other gases such as biomethane into the network. But the key benefit from that really was actually when you reduce the pressures in the existing pipelines, you automatically reduce leakage. And that's going to be a really critical enabler for you know, if we want to produce a hydrogen system in the future. Um, I mean, there's lots of different projects I can talk about, but I think ultimately there's really nice alignment between all these um, organizations and initiatives in the sector, and particularly um, within Innovate UK. We collaborate with all of them. We share our learnings because our model is a giant leap together. We can't achieve mm -hmm. some of this, you know, supply chain resilience without a collaborative um uh, you know, workforce. So yeah, I'm more than happy if you want to email me and talk about projects as well. I'm just conscious of time. No, that's great, Beth. And I think it provides a really nice segue into the next question. You and Joe have really well illustrated how, despite the fact that all of us on this panel come from different backgrounds and are just happening to be in the same sector, we are still butting heads against the same challenges and we can't address them alone. So now my next question is for Craig and John from a private sector perspective. Um, why do you both think collaboration is key to unlocking opportunities across the hydrogen supply chain? If I can, yeah, go ahead, Craig. Uh, yeah, thanks, Serena. It's a, it's a good question, and, and I try and speak as specifically as I can on, on some of the challenges. So, so Rob talked through, you know, the, the strategic impact areas, and, and for me, one of the main challenges we can tackle with collaborative innovation is is the high cost of producing, storing, and using hydrogen in order to give us more options and flexibility across the energy system. So SSE, um, I mentioned in the intro, we understand that um, renewable power is at the heart of our decarbonisation journey, but we cannot ignore the crucial role that low carbon flexible power will play for when renewable electricity is not a direct option. And it's, it was touched on in some of the opening presentations as well. So. Collaborative innovation is key to reducing cost and also to ensure that the right solutions are developed that, that have this widest strategic impact, as Carbon Trust have highlighted in, in the report, but also the greatest chance of, of wide scale commercial adoption. So I'm sure there are plenty of technology developers 
uh, listening to the call that, that understand how difficult it is to go from a successful lab prototype to a commercially deployed technology or solution. So that's that's where collaboration across the supply chain, I think, can come in. Um, from my perspective at SSE, I want to minimize all the risks around deploying a new hydrogen technology. So the business and investors can, can have confidence that, that these new technologies are going to work safely mm -hmm. and how we want them to work, you know, under the conditions demanded by the application. So I, I really think that if different parts of the, the supply chain can work together earlier in the process to define product requirements um, and how the tech and understand how the technology is being qualified, particularly through latter stages of R and D, mm -hmm. this can certainly help reduce end user risks and and help us to more confidently deploy first of kind technologies. That's great. Thanks, Craig. And John, from your perspective as an SME, what are your views? Yeah, I, I agree with Craig's point. I said there's two areas of collaboration that are important for us. One is on a project itself. So we provide the technology which produces the hydrogen and takes the carbon out of the gas flow. But we need people both to assemble that unit for us. We're, we're really an R&D science specialist company someone to install it, and then an end customer who's actually going to use it. So one example is a project we're doing with United Utilities. They've created the demand for decarbonizing their gas and using their hydrogen. We have a, a, an EPC contractor called Jacobs who are working on that project to help us to test the input gases. Um, and we're working with an assembly partner called SMS Alderley to help us actually build and construct the units. So for us, to get scale quickly and to get our technology, as Craig said, from our Cambridge site, we're, we're based at Cambridge, to a number of locations, we need those partners to uh, to help us out. So that's, that's one area of, of on-project collaboration. The second one is between projects. This is not a competition, it's not a zero-sum game. I think many of us are gonna face the same challenges, be they commercial, regulatory, technical, and a group, a forum like this one, where we can share practical experiences of what we found has helped us and what the, the hurdles have been, will just make everybody go quicker. So we've seen in the two years that we've been rolling our technology out, collaboration in those two buckets really help us to get scale. And the nice problem that we have, and I'm sure many people have here is, there is a huge demand for particularly on-site low carbon hydrogen. So a lot of the collaboration problem solving is how do you meet that demand? It, it, it's nice that we are not trying to create an industry without the pull factor there. So I think there's a very kind of positive intent around the collaborators to help get things going and, and get it going uh, quickly. And I like what you said there, John. I think it's a, an important reminder that we're in a very unique position in the hydrogen sector that actually we can go faster and further together rather than having to choose to do one or the other. Um, there is a question that has come through in the Q&A that I think we can just quickly pick off before we move on. Um, from an anonymous attendee, are we satisfied that we will have enough low carbon electricity. My concern is that the government ambition seems low. It would be useful to do some back sums to either raise the ambition or firm up on priority areas. Joe, so, do you want to have any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I think for me, this is this is back to, if you remember the slide that Paul, the quite busy sh slide that Paul showed with all of the systems that need to be taken into account of. And I think, you know, that's why you know, we're stressing the importance of taking a systems approach here. It's not mm -hmm. just about thinking about even that, I mean, that that 10 gigawatt of low carbon hydrogen, that's a, I mean, that's a stretching target, but we think it's credible for the UK. It positions us really well internationally, but you, we have to think about it with that systems approach to make sure it all makes sense. And that's the thinking that's going on. And I appreciate you mentioning the role of knowing what's going on in the international landscape. For any of the audience members who are interested, Rob has just written an answer to a question on just that. So please have a look at the answered questions under the Q&A. Um, so obviously we've talked about collaboration, innovation, how it's great and wonderful, which of course it is. 
but it's also costly, or at least it can be. So one of the questions that we've got here is what is the role of public funding versus private funding in unlocking the hydrogen sector and how can we most effectively utilize it? So Beth and Joe, I had this one down for you too, but if Craig or Johnny got any thoughts, please do feel free to unmute and come in. You go, Joe. Yeah, I mean, I mean, absolutely. Well, as I'm sure you'd expect me to say, of course, but both public and private funding have a role. I mean, it's something that we think about quite carefully when we design our competitions. You know, some of them we offer 100% funding through an SBR route. I wrote others, we very deliberately use a grant funding route because we find both have advantages. So, for example, our industrial hydrogen accelerator, for us, it was really important to use a grant route there, and partly because they were, they were big projects and that they needed that matched that match funding but they also we really wanted to see the collaborations coming together and kind of people really having skin in the game so mm -hmm. so both both are powerful and oh yeah I'll, I'll hand over to Bethany now because yeah of course I'm going to speak more about the, the role of public funding because that's sort of where I sit in terms of Innovate UK um public funding is really crucial um and we have kind of a duty of care to our consumers as well as well as you know businesses in the UK to unlock that economic growth that um, Paul Monks spoke about in his beginning presentation. Hydrogen UK estimate that there's about 14 billion pounds worth of economic growth that could be accumulated by 2030 and it's only our duty to to stimulate some of that growth so that we can all benefit it benefit from it wider um, not just in the UK but in Europe as well because as people who you know work in the energy sector we're very very closely tied to European markets. And, you know, it's it's like um, John was saying, we need a collaborative approach. We need those, those sharing of insights. And in terms of sharing of insights and addressing similar barriers, which John also mentioned, public funding has this ability to, to see over multiple different competitions, multiple different sectors. We've brought technologies in from startups in the water sector and use them in the gas sector to unlock mm -hmm. um, some gas innovation and carbon savings there. Um, and also being, being in the Strategic Innovation Fund, we work closely with the regulatory body as well. So we can, we can inform policy on what the in innovation results are producing. So for example, um, for those of you who work in the gas sector, you'll know that we have quite an old shrinkage and leakage model, which is used to um, account for gas leakage on the transmission system. It was developed in the 90s, um, early 2000s, and actually it's just an average depending on the material of pipeline, how much leakage you would expect in that pipeline multiplied by the length. So we did, we, did, um, we funded an innovation project called the uh, Digital Platform for Leakage Analytics, and we were bringing in disruptive technologies to physically detect the leakage in the gas system create a digital model using um, lots of artificial intelligence and machine learning tools. And actually that project is now using, uh, is now informing policy around the shrinkage and leakage model. So I think that's where the public sector really comes in and adds benefit to innovation in this space. Yeah, so Serene, I can, I can add a little bit as well then. Um, so apologies, I am an engineer, so. I'm, I'm not from a funding background, but I'll, I'll do my best from SSE's perspective. So as, as far as I'm aware, our hydrogen and carbon capture projects need some form of public funding to make them a viable business option, you know, to go ahead for investors to make a return on their investment. And if we can achieve these first of a kind projects that, that companies like SSE are planning, um, this can certainly give confidence to the supply chain that the UK is going to be at the forefront of of some of these hydrogen developments. I've got one example, um, is, is SSE Thermal's Alvra Hydrogen Pathfinder project, which we're hoping to be supported through the Net Zero Hydrogen Fund Strand 3, through hydrogen business model support, where we would be supported financially for every kilogram of hydrogen we produce. We then plan to store it in large quantities in one of our existing salt caverns, and then burn it in a gas turbine to produce electricity when renewable penetration into the grid is low. So that this is a demonstrator project for large scale and also long term energy storage of hydrogen as a method of balancing the intermittency of renewables. 
So we aim to start producing hydrogen and storing in 2026, so in about three years' time. However, this, this project is, is only going to make commercial sense if we get support through the hydrogen business model. Um, and I think this is a good example of a, of a great, um, you know, of how private and public funding can work together, or will hopefully work together to deliver a first of a kind project, um, first of a kind power to power project that I'm aware of anywhere in the world. And this will obviously place demand for further technology development and commercial deployment of novel hydrogen technologies, you know, which we will, of course, learn lots from, but so will all of our supply chain partners. And, you know, as we deliver more projects of a similar nature, we can, we can of course, start to reduce our dependency on, on public funding. And it's really interesting hearing the views from all of you and particularly in the context of that phenomenal figure that you gave Beth around the size of the, the UK opportunity for hydrogen between now and 2013. Um, and I think it leads into a wider point. So we've all heard a lot of conversation around hydrogen import and export, the role that um, UK PLC can play in that, skills and jobs that we can develop as well, and how, as you say, Beth, we can make the UK the Silicon Valley um, for energy innovation and in this context, hydrogen. How can we make the how can we make sure the UK can capitalize on its skills and expertise to maximize the value available from the hydrogen sector? And what are some of the challenges that we're facing and any potential lessons we could learn from abroad? Um, and that is open to whoever would like to come in on that. Uh, I'll start if you don't mind. Um, so I think there is one point to make in that hydrogen technology is not new. It's mm -hmm. been around for a long time and it's, mm -hmm. it's widely used around the world, actually mostly for agriculture. Um, they they generate hydrogen to produce fertilizer, and that's how, where most of the hydrogen goes. Um, but unfortunately, 99.6% of hydrogen that's produced in the world comes from um, gray or brown hydrogen. So it comes from methane or coal. Um, so in terms of in terms of the industry and the supply chain, it's there. It's just not the way we want it to be. We want green hydrogen. Um, we also have a massive skill set from the petroleum industry, um, oil and gas, a, a lot of the bespoke products that we need to, to unlock the hydrogen supply chain is going to come from the oil and gas industry in terms of those uh, specific valves, which Rob was talking about, and, you know, specific modification parts that we need for compressor engines or how we're going to convert some of the salt caverns to, to adopt pure hydrogen or maybe a blend of hydrogen. So I think I don't want to overlook what we already have, um, but there is definitely space for more skill sets to come in and particularly in the digital space. So as we start to digitalize some of this supply chain and unlock some of the connections between the, the gas sector and the electricity sector, we're gonna need you know, some really serious experts in terms of uh, digital processing, um, analytics, machine learning, AI, um, and also as that digital complexity expands, there's more surface area for cyber attacks. So there is a real skill set and there is a real need for some disruptive digital technologies in this sector to unlock the supply chain for hydrogen. Great, Beth, thank you. Sorry, um, I'm really passionate. So I, <laughs> no, um, you know, I'm if there are any it. digital experts, you know, make yourself known to me. Mm. And we will be sharing some communications after the webinar with um, details, including Beth's email address. Um, do any of the other panelists want to come in and add to that? And if not, then we can move on to the next question. Um, so I can see that one's just come through in the Q&A box. From an anonymous attendee, how is the hydrogen how is hydrogen infrastructure planning conducted with a whole systems perspective in the UK? For instance, accounting for existing and other energy infrastructure, end use needs, and use, and so on. How might chip and other projects feed into this? Rob, I'm gonna throw it to you if that's all right. I think you have some interesting views, both from 
the perspective of different stakeholders that we engaged during the design of CHIP, but also from some of the other things that we've been working on in the background of Carbon Trust. And then if anyone else would like to come in after Rob, then please feel free to. So I think, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Unfortunately, the uh, the attendee is anonymous, so I can't attribute that to anyone, which is a shame. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's a really good point. And one of the things that Carbon Trust really focuses on and all of its activities in the energy transition is trying to promote that, that real systems view and understanding what are the best tools to decarbonize you know, specific end use applications or end use sectors. I think in terms of CHIP, the way we're trying to address that specifically in this program is by making sure that we have uh, an industry membership that covers a man as much of that um, kind of energy system as possible. Um, so, you know, making sure that we have a diverse membership that can uh, capture some of those issues that exist right across that energy infrastructure is really important to us. Um, I think as well, and I am going to stray slightly from the question here, Serene, um, as part uh, kind of developing alongside chip we're also developing a uh, another joint industry program called the regional hydrogen platforms program we haven't launched this it's still in development um, but this is really going to be the kind of carbon trust take on let's look at a specific geographical region understand what energy systems are already in place where does the gas network go where does the electricity network go what kind of energy end uses are there in a specific area map that out get key stakeholders on board and then take a systems view of that specific region and go where can hydrogen best be used as a decarbonization lever so we're a little bit earlier on in kind of our development of that we haven't launched it like we have chip but we're hoping that in the coming months and years that these programs can work alongside each other to um, help tackle that systems view. So just to summarize, CHIP, we're making sure that we have the right industry partners to make sure that we're looking right across those different energy systems. And we're also developing kind of follow on programs um, at the Carbon Trust to start addressing some of these issues more directly. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rob. And that's the plug that I was hoping that you were going to give. So excellent. Um, okay, so another question has come through in the chat, but in the Q&A, sorry. But before that, I just want to come back to some of the pre-prepared questions. I think increasingly we're seeing that there is a huge role for innovation and actually innovation can take many different forms, not, not just technological and it's spread across the sector. Um, and so my question is now for John, what is the role for SMEs in accelerating the development of the hydrogen sector? And the link in my mind is that obviously, I'm sure you'll speak to this more than I will, but obviously SMEs tend to be the home for a lot of innovation across the energy space. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you. So I've been with Lividian for two years and came from eight years at Centrica prior to that. So I've seen both sides of the spectrum of the uh, organizational side. I, I think for me, we talked about collaboration earlier on and the role SMEs play can be to move very quickly to flex to the needs of larger customers very often. I think both in terms of commercial flexibility, technical ability to adapt, that, that speed is something that SMEs have, I think more than, than uh, large corporates have. And also uh, I think it's that um, both flexibility and speed to action. So if, if we decide to do something very quickly, we can make a decision in a day and get it done. There aren't very large board and panels that we have to go through. Equally, if a large corporate says to us, you need to stick to this criteria, we are able to flex to meet that. So one example is a project we're doing over in Abu Dhabi, and we're working with Adnoc, who are the big national oil company over there, and we're making hydrogen from a gas processing facility. Now, it's very hard to, uh, to get them to let us do that, because we're very small, they're very aware of their um, safety processes. So we are having to completely flex to their needs, which is relatively easy given our adaptability and our speed to do that. And this is a project that we're doing prior to COP28, uh, which is in November. So I think there are clearly roles for, for, for corporates, but I think 
the role of SMEs is, particularly with new technology and trying new things, flexibility, speed of adaptation, and also ability to work and play play well with others, particularly to kind of fit in with those larger uh, larger corporates. No, that's a fantastic point. We do a lot of work with SMEs at the Carbon Trust, and one of the key challenges that we hear over and over again is this fear from some bigger organizations of working with SMEs. They see that there's a risk, but understanding that actually the fact that you're so small gives you more agility and flexibility to align with those bigger companies, I hope is reassuring some of our um, audience members. Yeah, I, th I think the other reassuring thing is that really SMEs need proof points with large organisations to grow. And so it's, mm. it's hugely important for us that our first project with the likes of Adnoc or United Utilities are a success because mm. we have to make sure that that works for our growth story. So I think if you want to work with a group of people who really care passionately about uh, what they do and, and give everything to make it work, SMEs mm. having a bit of that culture uh, as well. Mm, absolutely. Can I and just add on to, on, add on to John's that. answer? Um, totally agree. And I think at the Strategic Innovation Fund, we recognize the value that SMEs bring to large networks in the energy sector. Mm -hmm. um, SMEs have that ability to move quickly, to adapt to particular problem areas. But what we do is we create partnerships between SMEs and the networks because the networks provide the data and the resources that the SMEs need to carry out accurate trials um, to, to generate evidence for new technologies which can then inform policy or or maybe we can take and, and commercialize and roll out to business as usual so as John said just reiterating that point that partnership between the SMEs who can move and the energy networks and large corporates who have the resources is really crucial. And I think um, you kind of alluded to it there, that collaboration is key because at the end of the day, successful trials means successful solutions that can be used across the hydrogen sector, so everyone wins. Um, okay, so I'm now going to go back to the question in the Q&A box from Frank. Uh, what are in the UK, the current developments are in the field of local hydrogen production and using this on site for heating of buildings or process heat for the SME industry. I think, Joe, you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to use this as an opportunity to talk about the industrial hydrogen accelerator again because I, I do love that program. <laughs> but I think I wanted to give you a few examples of projects that we've done under this because I think it really illustrates the potential of um, the, the processes Frank outlines. I mean, I, I have to say, I'm not aware of that many projects that are actually doing this at the moment, but one of the projects we funded under Industrial Hydrogen Accelerator, one of our demonstrations is the H2Go project, and they'll be using solar electricity to make, uh, to make hydrogen and then solid state storage, and then a commercial backsea boiler, all in, we call it's called heat in a box and it is going to be all be in a shipping container so this is like a modular system that can be used to you know harnessing the power of hydrogen to make heat and should be really really flexible with a, with a really low surface area another project that we've done a feasibility study under is, is looking at um, electrolysis connected to biomass power plant stations we've also done hydrogen connected to nuclear and then so hydrogen then goes on in these projects to be used in the steel sector or in cement um, so look out for the feasibility studies from these reports coming out it should should be coming out soon and there's some really exciting projects and we're also going to be announcing winners of some more demos to be built so I'm, I'm really yeah it's going to be really great to see what we can demonstrate in this space in the in the UK amazing thank you Joe. Uh, yeah, it's always exciting to hear about stuff that's actually going in the ground and where we are doing more of that learning by doing. Um, but obviously, to get to that, we need to have the right data. So from a desk research perspective, um, and Rob, I'm sure you can probably speak more to this than I can. Um, it was challenging at times to carry out those quantitative level, those quantitative pieces of analysis at the level of detail that we would have liked to due to the lack of data available. Um, and so Craig, this question's for you. Given your experience on the ground over at SSC, 
glider costs need to be reduced throughout the supply chain to facilitate the uptake of hydrogen to 2030? And what role can innovation play here? Sure, yeah, it's it's another good and not very easy to answer question, right. I must admit. But so I, th I do think the answer differs slightly depending on the system and how the, the hydrogen is being produced, stored and used. And I know I know Rob and the team have considered different use cases in, in the innovation needs assessment. So I think we all know that the cost of electricity and the electrolyzer capital costs are typically the highest cost parts of the system. So we can, of course, reduce these costs directly, but we should also consider the other major components in the system like storage and compression that can allow us to optimize how we use the higher cost electricity and electrolyzer. And it feeds into you know, what Bethany was saying about the, the digital technologies to, to help support this as well. Um, you know, one example is above ground compressed hydrogen storage is painfully expensive. Mm -hmm. And depending on the requirements and the project type, you know, the, the requirements for this can be, can be fast. So anything we can do to reduce the cost of, of this above ground compressed hydrogen storage would be would be hugely beneficial. Um, and then I, I mentioned earlier, but there's, there's one particular area that is very interesting to SSE Thermal, and that's the, the larger scale storage required to, 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 to load shift from renewable production, you know, store energy in the form of hydrogen at large scales to then be able to produce electricity again back into the back into the grid and a great way we can do this is with salt caverns and there's potentially other larger scale solutions in in future um, and and just a few specific parts of this um that, that i can think of so we've talked a lot about compressors you know specifically higher capacity high compression ratio compressors that can take us from the subsurface to to high pressure subsurface volumes um, there's the design and operation of the of the subsurface system, um, you know, considering geomechanical and, and biological effects on the ground. Um, I think it's been mentioned already as well that the accurate measurement of hydrogen flows and leakages, mm -hmm. leakages, you know, obviously can cost a lot of money, but obviously the you know from the the emissions point of view, fugitive emissions, of course, want to minimise that. And then there's the conditioning and purification um, related to salt caverns, but I think you know related to to any sort of storage medium, um, both both before and after storage. Um, so yeah, I, I'm sure, and I know there are plenty others, but we also do need to get on with developing some of these first of a kind projects as well mm. to start to learn more by doing. Mm. And by doing that, we can then start to generate some of the missing data that we need in order to do the cost reduction analysis effectively. So it all it all comes full circle. Um, Beth, you want me to, did you want to add something? Yeah, just a little bit around that innovation side, just to add on a few things from, from Craig. We are looking at co-location of storage and compression because we have compression technologies and you know they they have a massive technical base of experts surrounded each location. So can we put compressed storage in the same location as these compressor engines, because they often run more than they're actually needed to, to facilitate the, the operations of the gas network. So can we use that excess power um, to compress gas into storage? So that's something we're funding and looking into. Um, the, the other thing actually, in terms of innovation and sort of enabling that piece around production as well, is actually how do we process water? How do we manage it? So to unlock green hydrogen, um, it takes on average 18 litres of mains, mains water to produce one kilowatt hour through an electrolyzer. That's a huge amount of water. So how can we minimise the pure, so, sorry, how can we minimise the number of purification steps of the water before we use it in the electrolyzers? That will, that will cheapen um the production of electrolyzers and also identifying where we can put these specialist purification plants or technologies will inform where we locate some of these electrolyzer production sites as well um, so that's just something that we're looking into and then of course as craig said that the digital as aspects and unlocking vector shifting between the electricity network users 
as well as um, hydrogen users as well, because that's a, a really critical enabler to maximizing the benefits and then making it more economically viable to invest in some of these technologies. Thank you for sharing that. This is exactly why it's so great that we have the likes of you at Innovate UK and also the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero on our advisory panel so that we can join up all of our thinking, learn from what it is that you've been doing and make sure that anything that we do on CHIP really is addition. And on that note, I think I'm going to close the panel session. Thank you all so much for coming along and joining us this morning. It has, I'm biased because as everyone knows, I love talking about hydrogen, but I found it really interesting and stimulating. And I hope that members of the audience have as well. Um, it's been really great to hear from all of your different perspectives, but also really reassuring and exciting, as I mentioned at the start of the panel, to hear how despite the fact we all represent different interests and in different parts of the sector, we still have such strong alignment on what needs to be done. And that makes it easier for us to take the necessary steps and really accelerate innovation across the sector, um, which hopefully we'll be doing a lot of through CHIP. It's really amazing to see the progress that we've done. Rob, again, well done to you and the team who led that innovation needs work because it is incredibly thorough and really um, insightful. So after this webinar, I would really encourage all of you to have a and if any of you are interested in hearing a bit more about CHIP, any plans that we've got for the future, who's on our membership committee or our um, advisory committee, if you'd like to become a member or just anything else, then please do reach out to myself or Rob. We will be circulating our details after the webinar.